even though it may seem tempting to enter the metabolic state of ketosis. It's important to understand the caveats of ketosis so that you fully understand your risks for developing long-term complications. What, what exactly is ketosis? All right, guys, so there you go. Dr. Cyrus Kambata from Forks Over Knives is going to tell us all about the truth about ketosis. He's going to debunk it once and for all. He's from a completely non-biased organization that's totally legitimate and just so sciencey. They call themselves Plant-Based News, PBN. All right, so let's check it out. Let's see if he's got some legitimate arguments. Let's see if he actually brings anything to the table, or let's see if he treats his audience like a bunch of infantile retards uh, and gives them a bunch of little tiny straw man arguments and erects a false um, a false opponent to then tear down, which is what most of these vegan so-called debunkers and even people in the fitness industry love to do. So let's see what's going on in the uh, in the vegan echo chamber of uh, of straw man Mortal Kombat champions like uh, Mr. Cyrus Kambata. It starts by giving a very basic elementary uh, definition of a ketogenic diet, and that takes up like the first minute of it. It's not a very poor definition of keto. Um, he basically says it's a low carbohydrate diet where fat makes up the majority of the caloric intake and um, slightly misrepresents saying that dairy is a major part of all keto diets, which that's an assumption. There's a lot of people that do keto without any dairy at all. And then he goes on to say this. In addition, the state of ketosis induces a number of short-term benefits, including rapid weight loss, reduced fasting glucose, reduced post-meal blood glucose, reduced A1C, reduced total cholesterol, reduced LDL cholesterol, and flatline blood glucose. The problem is that eating a ketogenic diet significantly increases your risk for chronic disease and premature death in the long term. After researching the advice from the top ketosis gurus, we made a list of the seven biggest and most dangerous misconceptions about ketogenic diets. Okay, so there you go. We're not looking at a scientific breakdown of why keto is not good. He's just openly admitted right here. We cherry picked what we call the seven biggest and most dangerous misconceptions about ketogenic diet through looking and cherry picking through popular keto leading authorities which they never name and they never cite so they basically are cherry picking shit that they can straw man what a surprise it's the vegan way right in this video we're going to detail about the truth underlying ketosis and refute many common statements backed by misleading science incorrect biochemistry, and a fundamental lack of understanding of human biology. So a fundamental lack of understanding of basic human biology. Where is this demonstrated? So basically you're saying that some people on the internet who talk about keto don't know what they're talking about. Okay, wow, so does that mean that I can go on Durian Rider's channel or Happy Healthy Vegan and straw man them for having not not having a basic understanding of human biochemistry of uh cell metabolism of uh much of the scientific method at all no i can't do that because that doesn't make sense but in the vegan world it's not about actual logic it's not about an actual uh conversation it's not about actually progressing the knowledge that we have it's about cherry picking nitpicking and um you know just straw man arguments in order to prop up your preconceived religious inclination towards a vegan diet. Ketosis misconception number one. Insulin is your fat storage hormone. Now you may have heard people in the ketogenic community refer to insulin as your fat storage hormone and that by adopting a very low carbohydrate diet you prevent your blood glucose from spiking after a meal. Now hold on a second. Open any biology textbook and you'll find that the primary function of insulin is to help glucose exit your blood and enter tissues. But that insulin also helps fatty acids and amino acids enter your blood and enter tissues. It is absolutely critical to understand that the primary function of insulin is to help transport glucose out of your blood and into tissues. And <laughs> okay. To say that the primary function of insulin is to do any one thing is a ridiculous logical fallacy. That's so unscientific, it's ridiculous. Um, if anybody wants to understand the, uh, the functions of insulin, I highly recommend you check out ChrisMasterJohnPhD.com. He's got an article about the biochemistry of insulin, why insulin doesn't make you fat. So his first point right here is a total straw man. He's basically saying that, well, everybody that does keto says that insulin is the only thing that makes you fat. Um, when this is simply not true. I've been saying for years that insulin is not bad. Insulin is required 
Insulin is necessary for health. Without insulin, you become a corpse, right? Like type one diabetes used to be a death sentence, but today it's, uh, it's not because we've got exogenous insulin, luckily. But yeah, you know, insulin does promote storage of fat in the tissue, but this is all, this can all be overridden by energy status. Right, so insulin is not just a fat storage hormone. It is a hormone that can help your body to store fat. It is a hormone that shuttles glucose in and out of cells and regulates cellular energy. Um, but there's like there's all kinds of biochemical pathways that are also involved in this. We're talking about AMPK, um, <laughs> uh, an NADH, NADA positive ratio. Um, there's there's a lot of different things. So insulin can promote fat storage, but that's not its only mechanism. And insulin can promote, or does, does shuttle glucose in and out of cells, but that's not its only function. That's like saying the only function of your mouth is to chew. Well, <laughs> you know, it's like your mouth also, you can speak with your mouth, and when you're chewing, you're digesting your food, there's enzymatic, I mean, you're, you're, to create, you're taking a nuanced, very, very complicated biochemical um, process and hormone in the body that has many different functions and you're dwindling it down to a simple definition that's not true that's oversimplified and then you're that you're using this argument to say that low carb people do the same thing so this is just total hypocrisy typical veganism and um very easily debunked but unfortunately people haven't been taught how to you know properly explore things they don't really understand what the scientific method really is and dudes like this can get up there and be like yeah i've got a phd and check out my highly edited video where i'm reading off a teleprompter and it's all scripted and i have no eyebrows so you gotta listen to me because my name's dr kombucha uh, or kombata and uh, you know, people believe it because you call yourself a doctor um this is ridiculous in truth, a physiologically normal amount of insulin is absolutely required to stay alive. But secreting or injecting excess insulin is what substantially increases your risk for coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, and cardiovascular disease as a whole. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. How interesting. All right, so let's just keep that thought. Let's, let's remember that he said this because he's going to tear down an argument that I'm sure he'll make later on. So he says that excess insulin puts you at risk for heart disease. Now, when he said in the beginning of the video, I just remember this, I like to tie this back to the beginning of the video, ketogenic diets increase your risk of all cause mortality. Well, that's because the assumption is made by these people, people like the China study, people behind things like the China study, um, the assumption is made that atherosclerosis and heart attacks and heart disease is caused by cholesterol. But he just admitted right here that excess insulin is a main driving factor in atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality rates. Very, very, very interesting. So, of course, excess insulin is not just caused by eating carbohydrate. Excess insulin is caused by eating carbohydrate and fat in an excess of energy. In, an ex in a surplus of caloric energy, the body will become highly insulin resistant. When you overfeed carbohydrate, your liver becomes insulin resistant. Right, because your liver gets filled up with glycogen. Fruit is very full of fructose. That will fill liver glycogen incredibly rapidly. Um, and your liver naturally becomes insulin resistant when you eat a lot of glucose. When you eat a lot of fat, your f peripheral tissues, your muscle tissues, will become insulin resistant. This is called physiological insulin resistance. So when you're on a, f a high fat ketogenic diet, your muscles don't want to take up glucose because the lack of insulin signals them to use fat for energy. So your body's using fat for energy, you don't wanna take up glucose into the muscle tissue so they become insulin resistant because of the presence of all those fatty acids. This is a natural physiological process that helps to regulate energy balance and energy from both lipid and glucose in the blood through a whole range of situations that allows us to stay alive. Um, and he's admitting here, that excess insulin is a cause of cardiovascular disease, but I'm sure later on, he's gonna say that all cause mortality rates are increased on a ketogenic diet, just like you said in the beginning, but that's from the assumption that saturated fat causes coronary heart disease. So do you get to have it both ways? I guess if you're a vegan, you do. If you, get, you like to misrepresent uh, science and use straw man arguments, then you get to have it both ways. Um, but it really, I mean, logic doesn't matter in the world of veganism because remember guys, this is a religious movement. 
This has nothing to do with objective reality. This has nothing to do with science. For most of these people, this has absolutely nothing to do with health. It's about a belief system. And it's about justifying that belief system and um, also evangelizing it and shoving it down everybody's throats. Ketosis misconception number two. Eating carbohydrates spikes your blood glucose. Proponents of the ketogenic diet often argue that eat Oh, nice. All right, so cool. So this is the same point that I was just making. Now, carbohydrates do raise your your insulin levels, and you need insulin to shuttle carbohydrates into the cells. But the presence of excess carbohydrate in the context of excess dietary fat as well will be, will make you insulin resistant. So overeating both macros cause insulin resistance. And in order to get rid of this insulin resistance, you can either cut back on the carbohydrates, in which case you will be forced to burn fat for energy. Your muscles, your peripheral tissues may still remain insulin resistant. This is because your brain needs glucose in certain parts of it. There's certain parts of the brain that require glucose, and your body's very intelligent at partitioning the required glucose and getting it up to the brain so it doesn't take it up into the muscle tissues because that's excess. Um, so you can either cut back on carbs or you can cut back on the fats. Both of these things include relatively extreme restriction of one of those macros, right? So excess carbohydrate in the presence of excess fat is the problem. That's the standard American diet. Now all these surveys about uh, all-cause mortality increasing, these, they're all based on, all these studies are, uh, rather, are based on surveys. So they ask people these questions like, how many times a month do you eat this food, that food, this food, that food? All right, and then they base the results on what people say they eat, and then all-cause mortality rates increase on so-called high-fat diets because the people that are eating a bunch of ice cream, fried chicken, KFC, uh, McDonald's, and stuff like that, that's technically a high-fat diet even though it's high in fat and carbohydrates. But the people who answer the survey saying they eat a lot of fruit and vegetables and they eat a lot of whole unrefined foods, that tends to lie. Um, then they cherry pick it and they skew it. So it seems like, oh, well that means plant-based is better. No, it's just people who eat junk food tend to respond to these surveys in a, ways that seems to, in a way that seems to reflect a high fat diet, which is not a ketogenic diet. So, all right, his second point, another complete and utter joke. For these reasons, ketogenic dieters maintain a total carbohydrate intake less than 30 grams per day, representing less than 10% of total calories on average. Who wants to bet me that later on he recommends keeping fat at like 10% or less of total calories per day? So he scoffs at keto for restricting carbs, but then does the same thing with fat. How hypocritical is this? What those in ketosis don't understand is that the amount of glucose in your blood is not only determined by the amount of carbohydrate that you eat, but instead a reflection of both your dietary carbohydrate and your dietary fat. All right, so there, then he, <laughs> all right, so I dismantled his argument before he even made it. Um, there's another straw man. He's saying that just, he's saying that because I say that ketogenic dieters don't know this, therefore it is true, which is just complete and utter BS. Now we have written extensively about the detrimental role that excess dietary fat plays in the development of insulin resistance, leading to high blood glucose, increased insulin requirements, high cholesterol, beta cell death, and increased risk for many chronic diseases. All right, so there you go. He uses some more NLP propaganda terms. We have written extensively about the dangers of fat, but then he just said before this that it's the combination of carbohydrate and fat that will make you insulin resistant, right? That's the issue. It's not just carbs, not just fat. But then he goes on to kind of use a little bit of subtle NLP, and he might not even know what he's doing, but I think he does. Um, even his shriveled, uh, cholesterol-deficient vegan brain um, you know, understands how to manipulate human consciousness through twilight language and sprinkling words like death, beta cell death. <laughs> beta cell death. When in reality, your blood glucose is determined primarily by how much fat you eat, and secondarily, by the amount of carbohydrate that you eat. Okay, so that's some really stupid use of language right there. Like, that's, you're totally skewing it, man. Um, so you say, first of all, your argument is that everyone on keto s believes, 
because just because you say it, right? Just because you say it is so, then everyone on keto must believe this. So here's a nice little straw man for you. Everyone on keto believes that only insulin, or I'm sorry, rather only your carbohydrate intake uh, regulates your blood glucose levels. And then you say, well, the truth is primarily blood glucose levels are determined by how much fat you eat and secondarily how much carbohydrate you eat. How do you determine the primary and secondary causation there? Like this is, that's ridiculous. You can't prove that. That's just a complete, it's a word game that you're playing. And you just did exactly what you can, you, uh, claimed your so-called fake opponent that you're fake debating on your fake news channel is doing. So people who do a ketogenic diet restrict carbohydrates super low. And if they are to eat more carbohydrates, he says, they're going to be insulin resistant still. Now, this is true that you'll be physiologically insulin resistant in the state of, uh, of ketosis. On a high fat diet, your muscles don't take up glucose because you need it for your brain. But if you reduce your fat intake and increase your carbohydrate intake, you can easily transition to eating more carbohydrates. This isn't an issue. Eating, like I've said a million times, eating both macros in excess is a huge issue. So, um, here, listen to what he says here when he talks about the diet that he recommends and then the colors get all bright and shiny and then and this voice gets more soothing and sultry and Dr. Kombucha says that you should restrict your fat instead on a plant-based diet. It's really funny. It's like totally hypocritical, completely backwards. Because both fat and carbohydrate are present in large quantities, controlling your blood glucose becomes increasingly difficult over time. Now because a low-fat, plant-based, whole food diet is low in dietary fat, your carbohydrate tolerance or your ability to eat carbohydrate-rich food increases substantially, resulting in maximum insulin sensitivity and the opportunity to completely reverse insulin resistance altogether. When operating in a low-fat ecosystem on a plant-based diet, it is quite easy to maintain flatline blood glucose as long as your total fat intake is maintained below approximately 30 grams per day. So you're doing the same thing. You're restricting your fat to 30 grams a day. Anybody out there ever ate less than 30 grams of fat a day? Are you freaking kidding me? Maybe that's why this dude doesn't have eyebrows or eyelashes. Like you don't have a single hair on your face, dude. Do you pluck your eyelashes out? Ketosis misconception number three. Diabetes is carbohydrate toxicity and insulin resistance is a state of carbohydrate intolerance. Okay, so he's rewording his prior argument uh, and just, I mean, what is, how is this a common misconception? Who says that diabetes is a state of carbohydrate toxicity? Nobody says that. I don't say that. Um, you can check out a lot of highly intelligent um, experts in diet nutrition who eat non-vegan diets who will tell you that <laughs> diabetes is not a state of carbohydrate toxicity. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to really break down this one because it's just a rehashing of his previous one. He wanted to get to the s debunking seven misleading uh, misleading statements because that's how YouTube algorithms work. Um, they promote crappy clickbait content like plant-based news and like uh, you know, and Thomas DeLauer and stuff. So it's all about, you know, three foods you can eat to make your hair grow or s debunking seven misleading statements about ketogenic diets. Um, that's why he did seven things. And this is, this is just pathetic. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know how many people really take this seriously, but if you look at the comment section, there's a lot of people that are just like voting, like really rooting them on. Like, yeah, this is awesome. Love the education versus bro science all over the tube. Thank you. Um, says love yourself always. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know. I mean, obviously my audience is a little bit more intelligent and a little bit more dialed in and uh, knows how to analyze things like this, but it seems like some people really buy into this shit and that's, uh, that's pretty ridiculous. This is misconception number four. Carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient. The ketogenic world is quick to point out that there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, in contrast to required nutrients like essential fatty acids and essential amino acids. While this statement is technically true, let me... Okay, so then here's another word game. So then he cherry picks something that some people say in defense of low carbohydrate diets, which is true. You know, I mean, it's true that you don't need dietary carbohydrate. It is not an essential dietary nutrient. Your body can create glucose from both the backbone, the, the glycerol backbone of fatty acids or from glucogenic amino acids. Um, so it's not an essential nutrient dietarily because your body can make it. So he plays another word game. Let's go on to the next one and see if this one actually holds any water. Seizure incidents. However, ample evidence shows that ketogenic diets come with a laundry list of unwanted side effects that simply cannot be overlooked, including, but not limited to, diarrhea, 
nausea, constipation, vomiting, acid reflux, hair loss, kidney stones, muscle cramps, muscle weakness, hypoglycemia, low platelet count, impaired cognition, inability to concentrate, impaired mood, disordered mineral metabolism, stunted growth in children, increased risk for bone fracture. Okay, so he's talking about, he's listing all these so-called so long-term side effects. This is from the early 1920s. This is from when the ketogenic diet was for, it was the 20s or the 30s, I always forget. It was when ketogenic diets were first um, used and named for epilepsy uh, that a lot of these came about. So things like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, uh, they were feeding these kids like these liquid diets of like a bunch of fat. It was a highly restrictive diet because it was, de it was um, defined uh, to create a state of deep ketosis uh, in order to treat a very very difficult uh, thing and that's epileptic seizure in children uh, where they're not responsive to drugs uh, drug resistant epilepsy these kids are already sick they're already malnourished um, a lot of them already had brain damage they're incredibly uh, um, a lot of them have had really really hard lives and are living in hospitals most of the time so this disordered mineral metabolism stunted growth increased risk for bone fractures yeah, if you're doing like a medical ketogenic diet in the 1930s when they barely knew what they were doing uh, and you're dealing with like keto flu in the very beginning, you're going to get things like impaired cognition, inability to concentrate, but that's just a couple days while you get adapted. So he's cherry picking this. He is trying to be, he's being incredibly misleading here. Um, increased risk of bone fractures and all this stuff. I mean, these are side effects of low nutrition diets, not real ketogenic diets. This is completely misleading and pretty insidious that you do this, especially at the end of, oh, here you go, there's more. Increased bruising, acute pancreatitis, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, elevated cortisol, heart arrhythmia, myocardial infarction or heart attacks, menstrual irregularities, amenorrhea or loss of periods in women, and an increased risk for all-cause mortality or premature. <laughs> okay, so the increased risk of all-cause mortality, we talked about this earlier, this is from uh, so-called low-carbohydrate diets, and this is just from surveys asking standard Americans what they eat and then looking at if they die in a few years. This is ridiculous. Increased bruising, pancreatitis, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. You mentioned in the beginning that one of the side effects of keto was low cholesterol low total cholesterol. So you get it both ways, right? Because you're vegan. All right, I get it. Um, myocardial infarction, what you just talked about earlier, how um, hyperinsulinemia is a major factor in heart disease and myocardial infarction. So very, very, very interesting how you get to make uh, whatever associations you want whenever it suits your agenda. So here's another BS little thing. And I like how you put this long-term side effects of ketogenic diet list at the end of your straw man argument about um, you know, your little word game argument, it's not even a straw man, it's just a word game that you're playing about um, uh, d dietary carbohydrate not being required. This is really silly. Ketosis misconception number five. Low fasting insulin means high insulin sensitivity. People in the ketogenic community often measure their fasting insulin levels as an indicator of their insulin sensitivity. This is kind of a, a nitpicky thing here. When you are on a ketogenic diet, you become physiologically insulin resistant, just like we discussed earlier. Physiological insulin resistance on keto is desired. You don't want your muscles to be trying to take up glucose. You want them to become resistant to the glucose so that your brain can use the glucose it needs. So your body partitions the glucose for the brain, becomes insulin resistant in the muscle tissues and the peripheral tissues. Therefore, a glucose tolerance test is going to tell somebody on a ketogenic diet that you are physiologically insulin resistant and your glucose is going to go up on most people. Some people do great on glucose tolerance tests right off the bat on keto, but other people, if they eat carbs, they cut back on the fat and eat higher carbohydrate for a couple days before that, their insulin sensitivity comes up and they do very, very well on your cherry picked metric of insulin sensitivity, the glucose tolerance test. Well, I guess maybe that's not a cherry pick metric. It is a good metric of insulin sensitivity, but you're defining the goalposts here. You get to shift the goalposts all around whenever you want if you're a vegan. Uh, because again, it's not about logic, it's not about reason, it's about rhetoric, and it's about feeling, and it's about propaganda. Ketosis misconception number six. Low carbohydrate diets are not high protein diets. Let's go into detail to understand the caveats of this statement. The first question to ask is this, what proportion of total calories constitutes a high protein diet according to the scientific evidence? Now according to the evidence, diets containing more than 10 to 15% of total calories and protein increase your risk for cardiovascular and diabetes mortality, especially Okay, so then he goes on to make assumptions about uh, high protein diets being associated with all these naughty, naughty things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and death. Where 
this is just a straight up assumption coming out of nowhere, pulling it out of your ass. I mean, this is not science. You're looking at survey based studies, surveys, asking people what they eat. So dudes that are saying they eat a bunch of uh, a bunch of fried uh, a bunch of fried pork all day um, and ice cream and stuff like that. Um, and they eat at McDonald's all the time. That's supposedly like a high protein diet, right? If you're eating fried chicken every day, there's your high protein diet if you're eating KFC, right? Yeah, of course your risk for disease is going to be high if you're on the standard American diet and you answer one of these surveys, most of the people are going to be saying, yeah, most of the people that are overweight, they're going to be saying, yeah, I eat a lot of these high fat foods. I eat ice cream. I eat fried chicken. I eat all those things. I eat bacon. All the <laughs> You're cherry picking. This is ridiculous. You're misrepresenting a fake opponent and then tearing down the fake opponent. And, uh, but you're getting those clicks, right? You gotta get them clicks. Ketosis misconception number seven. Evidence-based research shows that low carbohydrate diets are effective. Low carbohydrate diet advocates are masters of documenting the efficacy of their philosophy using studies with small population sizes conducted over short time periods, often over either weeks or months. While these studies are helpful in assessing the short-term benefits of ketosis, they fail to document the long-term effects of a ketogenic diet. A classic example of this is a paper that was published in 2017 documenting the results of 10 weeks of a ketogenic diet in 262 patients following a diet containing less than 30 grams of carbohydrate per day and an average of 175 grams of protein per day. Now, the researchers document how 10 weeks of ketosis resulted in an average A1C decrease of 1%, an average weight loss of 7.2%, and how more than 56% of participants reduced their need for oral medication. These are all great outcomes. The problem is that the study was conducted in a small cohort over a relatively short period of time. Now, in order to determine the true effectiveness of any diet, you have to do two things. Number one, study your diet in large numbers of people, which is tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And number two, study the outcomes of people following your diet over long periods of time, greater than approximately five years. Studies conducted in tens or hundreds of thousands of people over five plus years indicate that low carbohydrate diets promote the following disastrous outcomes. Number one, increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Number two, increased risk for hemorrhagic stroke. Number three, increased risk for hypertension. Number four, increased risk for atherosclerosis. Number five, increased risk for diabetes mortality. Number six, increased risk for obesity. Number seven, increased risk for cancer. Number eight, increased risk for all-cause mortality, which is premium. Okay, so here we go. His last one, his fatality. Baraka has given us the vital doozy. Um, you're not even talking about ketogenic diets. You're talking about survey-based evidence for low-carb diets or high-fat diets, which are basically people who eat a standard American junk food diet and then report themselves on surveys. And you're making assumptions about causality between cholesterol and heart attack, cholesterol and disease, and whatever food intake and whatever other things you're cherry-picking for cancer and whatnot. Um, I don't see any evidence here. You're not presenting any real documented evidence. This is just yet another word game incredibly deceptive and misleading thing um, let's see let's see what you finish your video off with there's just a few seconds left a trip death from any cause no matter how you slice it low carbohydrate diets trick patients and doctors into believing that ketosis is an excellent long-term dietary strategy when in reality the long-term consequences are often worse than the initial condition they were designed to reverse now the next time you consider adopting a ketogenic diet ask yourself a simple question are the long-term consequences worth the short-term benefits so this dude, Dr. Cyrus Kambucha, or Dr. Cyrus Kambata, PhD. Let's see where he's from. He, he has Mango Man Nutrition and Fitness, um, and he's a doctor. He's a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, I want to see. All right, so he's from Plant Based News. This is, here's the founders of Plant Based News. These guys, just real, real clever looking dudes. Um, so, I don't know. I don't know what else to say there. Just some typical vegan degeneracy. Easily debunked, easily refuted. Don't just make assumptions just because somebody gets up and blah, 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 in front of a camera and says they're a doctor. I'm a PhD. I'm Dr. Cyrus Kombucha. You know, I mean, just because somebody's got a PhD doesn't mean they know what the hell they're talking about. It doesn't mean that they've got your best interests in mind. Uh, these people are obviously pushing an agenda. We've got plant-based news. We've got the forks over knives, folks. We've got millions of dollars getting pushed into pumping this vegan propaganda. Um, Cherry-picking metrics for health and wellness. Completely ignoring real issues in the world and arguing about minutia. Right? You never hear any of these vegan people's talking about the degradation environmentally done uh, by 
the pesticide-based agriculture that vegan and vegetarian diets are all about, right? There's no talk about Monsanto, about Roundup, about the damage to the gut microbiome, about the chelation of the soil, and the use of a broad-spectrum antibiotic, aka Roundup, uh, so profusely in all of these top corn, wheat, and soy crops, which are all consolidated through the revolving door of government and corporations. You've got Monsanto running the FDA for how many decades now? We've got the EPA, the uh, the American Heart Association, uh, the USDA, the FDA, all of these being run by the heads of major industry and corporations. But you don't hear any of the vegans talking about this. They're just talking about this so-called utopia, this you know, this so-called uh, healthy vegan diet and this fake utopia of uh, a completely unnatural diet where your entire food supply is consolidated in the hands of a very few people uh, and that's why Bill Gates the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who've historically loved spreading genetically modified patented monopolized seeds all around the world and monopolizing the seed supplies and bastardizing and removing the genetic heritage of heritage crops all around the world that's why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation promote vegan and vegetarian diets because it helps them to consolidate power and to have more control over the food supply <sighs> basic basic stuff so if you don't have a uh, you know solid foundation in analyzing faulty arguments if you don't have a solid foundation in understanding what the scientific method is and what misrepresentations of science is and what um you know, if you just don't have a solid uh, uh, worldview formed, it's really hard to combat this nonsense that's constantly being pumped out here on the internet and, you know, through major propaganda networks that uh, promote people like this uh, this guy, Cyrus Kambata, PhD. You know, it's like he's, he's uh, I'm looking at his website right now, he's got KQED, uh, an NPR, Forks Over Knives, Fast Company, PBS. Now, I mean, this guy's getting public money to go on and spout bullshit and talk to you like you're idiots. Like, how dumb do you think your audience is? You directly contradict yourself ten times in this video at least. Um, and just totally misrepresent the fake opponent that you're supposedly um, debunking. So this is just nonsense. I can't believe that taxpayer money going to NPR and PBS, which they should not, they shouldn't be national public radio or public broadcasting system. Uh, we shouldn't be being propagandized and lied to using our own tax dollar money. So uh, yeah, this Dr. Cyrus Kambata guy, uh, so-called PhD in nutritional biochemistry, once again demonstrating just how dumb these vegans think you are. I mean, this is insulting. You can find more at PrimalEdgeHealth.com. I'll see you guys next time. Question everything, even my assumptions.